You're inside the press box. Christian FM Sports presents Inside the Press Box, where we discuss all sports from our favorite high school team to college and pro. Here's your host, Paul Tipton and Gary Paris. Hey, Vero Nation. Paul Tipton along with Gary Paris. As, uh, we have to put a wrap-up on the football season as Vero Beach in the third round of the playoffs comes up short against Deerfield Beach 35-7. to The Bucks get to move on to the fourth round, and the Fighting Indians get to reflect, Gary, on the 2019 season. Yeah, that was a um, – that's a – that's a tough game. I mean, how do you – I listened to you and Matt. Uh, I was in New Orleans and uh, on assignment with UCF, and I was getting ready – we were getting ready to play the, the Green Wave, Tulane Green Wave at noon the next day. But I had a chance to listen to you and Matt, and you all did a great job, great job broadcasting, especially that first half was kind of exciting first half. Paul, let me ask you this. You were there. And I wasn't. This team, Deerfield Beach, came in. They're nine and three. Mm-hmm. Three losses to to some pretty good teams. Yeah, very good teams. Vero comes in eleven and zero, mm-hmm. and some big wins. Yep. What made the game be so lopsided? I think, you know, Gary, really it boils down to one simple thing, you know, and you you always hear the old saying about coaches. It's like, you know, to be a good coach, you got to have Jims and Joes. I think their Jims and Joes were just better than our Jims and Joes. I mean, to be quite honest, you know, we knew and we didn't want to overhype Deerfield going into the game, but we were told that between their senior class and their junior class that they have 26 Division One prospects. Now, sometimes when you hear a number like that, you go, "Oh, come on! No team could have that many, you know, Division One prospects on a team." I mean, you know, you know, you and I have been around this game long enough that you know, if if a team has two, you're thinking, "Well, they must be pretty good." You start getting around five or seven, you're going, "This is a really good team." You start talking about twenty six. That's just unheard of, but they did. I mean, they had a lot of talent on the field. I mean, I don't know that we saw 26, you know, Division One prospects on the field, but we certainly saw a good 10 to 12 of them for sure, starting with that running back, uh, Knighton, that, you know, was uh, a recent decommit from FSU. Of course, by the way, Gary, as uh, you may have heard, that uh, the interim coach was there. Um, I was going to tell you. I yeah. was going to ask you. I, <laughs> he was there. <laughs> I, I saw that where he was there, there to ride to get the yeah. young man to recommit. Yeah. Yeah, so kudos to him. Uh, certainly, Jalen uh, Knighton put a, a good performance on. Uh, but yeah, you know, when the game got started, Gary, Matt and I are looking at this, and we're like going, you know, Vero's got to play a perfect game in order to have a chance in this game. Now, you know, Joe Pinkos from Florida High School Football had Deerfield favored by seven points. I looked at that, and looking at how Pinkos tends to pick games, I look at it and I go, wow, they're only favored by seven. If they have that much talent on that side, and then we're, they're only favored by seven, that means I love Vero's chances in this ball game. And Matt asked me before the game, what do you think our chances are? I said, I definitely think it's 50-50. He was kind of surprised that I thought that. But I felt like, the, given the way that Vero Beach had played all season long, the schedule that they had, I mean, the RPI certainly reflected it, that it, they had one of the best RPIs in the state, that they, they've been battle-tested. But I also look at the fact that this is what, this was the 12th game of the season for Vero Beach, uh, 13 if you count the preseason game. And sometimes, you know, when you're talking about kids that are anywhere from 15 to potentially, you know, 19 years old, that's a lot of wear and tear on the body. That's a lot of games that they've had to play, practices, mental fatigue, I think, can set in. And then also, too, I think, you know, you just ultimately have to tip your cap to Deerfield Beach. They just had more talent on the field. And like I said, Vero Beach had to play a perfect game and they didn't. They didn't play that perfect game. And so Vero, Vero Beach, um, you know, really succumbed to the talent that Deerfield had. Now, when the game got started, Deerfield marches down the field, six plays, 59 yards. They score. And we're not really thinking much of it because we saw that against Treasure Coast a week ago. And we thought, eh, no problem. We've, we've been down this road before. Vero even comes out. 
gets a uh, I think one or two first downs on the first drive. They end up punting the ball away. They force Deerfield on a three and out. And you're going, all right, defense is starting to figure this out. Vero comes back. They score, and we're tied at seven. And you could just sense the energy in the stadium changed, and you started to feel like, all right, maybe Vero is going to seize momentum here. But then you give credit to Deerfield, and they started to stiffen up their defense a little bit, and then they end up with another good drive, and Knighton gets into the end zone. It's 14-7. I think Vero Beach really missed a, a key opportunity in that first half. They could have got them another touchdown. And I think, Gary, just from a mental standpoint, if you could go to the locker room tied up, I think it's a different ball game. And even though 14-7 doesn't sound like a big deal, I think that was where the swing started to happen, personally. Well, you know, Paul, I had a chance to look at their film, and I saw the Palm Beach Central game. They blew Palm Beach Central out. I mean, Mm -hmm. it wasn't even... And I was like, wow, this team is loaded. It's got speed. It's got size. It's got talent all over the field. Pick a position is probably a very talented position. And you got to go back. They lost their games earlier in the year, and they kind of, they, but that's when their quarterback was hurt. Yep. And he didn't get a chance to play until he, when he, when he came back, this was a different ball team. Yep. I'm talking about Pratt, their, yep. their quarterback. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at it like that, you kind of, you kind of like in a, in a, an analogy that I could best say would be like you're going to run a 440. Okay, you're running the 440, and at the 20, 220 point in the race, you're only a yard behind. Yeah. Thinking, okay, I still got a half the race to go, and I'm only a yard behind. And by the end of the ga- end of the race. I'm 10 yards behind because (laughs) the athleticism of the team took over Mm -hmm. and just I didn't have enough kick to stay with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough manpower or or, or strength to to stay with in this race or to the end of the game as this – my analogy is. And at the end of the game, I played – I did the best I could. I just didn't – I was way – they had too many athletes, or I wasn't athletic enough mm-hmm. to win that race. And that's the way I, I, I took this analogy was that after the first half, we we were close. Mm-hmm. We could have been even with them at halftime. But the second half, Paul, their talent level took off and was so much better than our level. It was. And, and, and that's not trying to knock our kids. I'm not doing that. No. I'm proud of the way Vero Beach won games this year. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you get exposed the second half, and they had so, many, so much depth uh, on their team in all positions. You're right, and you know, and when you look at the you know the game, and you reflect back, especially when you you look at the data and what it shows you, we only had 23 yards on the ground for the entire game. When you can't get that running game going, that tells you a couple of things. One, your offensive line's not getting the surge that they need to and opening up the holes, and secondarily, now your defense it, it can play a totally different game. Because they they can dictate a little bit more to what the offense is going to do. And that's really what we started to see. Because when we can't get the defense on their heels a little bit, we can't open up that passing game. And that's really what started to happen. And then they could start to pin. Once they, they got those couple of touchdowns in the third quarter, then they knew, okay, Vero's got to go to a quicker game. They're going to start throwing the ball more. And those defensive ends, they started pinning their ears, and they were coming. And it changed the game. It, it sounds like to me, Paul, they made us one-dimensional. Totally. The thing that Vero could not afford to do mm-hmm. was be one-dimensional. Yep. yep. They took away the running game and forced Vero Beach to throw. Yep. And they knew then that they could pin the ears back on all their linemen, mm-hmm. and they could blitz, they could stunt, and Vero didn't have an answer for for that type of pressure. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, and it's it's just unfortunate. You know, and we talked about this uh, even just a couple of weeks ago, how we felt like Vero was starting to peak at the right time. And I don't know if if it's just a matter of we just played so mu- a, a, a much better team or did we peak, you know, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago? I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that Vero Beach just did not have enough in the tank 
on that Friday night to be a very talented Deerfield team. It tells you if you make it to the third round, you better have a whole bunch of quality mm-hmm. ball players to yeah. play because each level gets better and better, especially when you get to the third round. Viral's been there mm-hmm. before, and they've lost there before too. And yeah. a lot of the times it's just that – Sometimes it was a close game, like against Dr. Phillips a few years ago. They mm-hmm. could have gone either way. Right. But this time it sounds like Deerfield just had way too much talent. And, you, you know, when you – let me ask you this, Paul. Mm-hmm. It was 35-7 to 7 was the final score. Right. I mean, it's not like you got outcoached. No, it's, I don't think it, so. It's not like you got uh, – one play lost the game for you. Right, you know, you know, it was just a a great program that came in here and won the game. Absolutely, you know, and again, you know, as I started to say, Vero had to play a perfect game, and and there's a lot of aspects to when you say something like that. It's not just about you know they can't turn the ball over and they got to keep the penalties down, which they didn't turn the ball over. They did have ten penalties for a hundred yards. That definitely hurt the team on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, you can't have that many penalties against a, a team like Deerfield. That's just too much that you're giving to them, especially 100 yards. I mean, that's marching down the field all the way from end zone to end zone and saying, here you go, here's a score, basically. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, you cannot allow a team like Deerfield Beach to have short porches and those kind of things, and that's honestly what ended up happening. And so Deerfield, you know, a very well-balanced team, was able to use their running game when they needed to. They used their passing game when they needed to. And, you know, in a lot of play action off that run, set up a big plays on the passing side for Deerfield. Well, you know, when you lose 35-7, to you kind of look back and say, okay, you know, we did everything we possibly could. We really studied the film. We really mm-hmm. thought we had yeah. a good game plan. Yeah. And we just got beat by a, a better and stronger horse. Yeah. Okay, you lose a game by three points or a touchdown. You second guess yourself sometimes that I call the right, right. play. Did yeah. I? Did I? Where did I mess up? Right. We did. We miss that. Drop yeah. that pass, or did we uh, mm-hmm. uh, miss one that we should? You, you then you then you don't sleep well at all for for several a month or so because mm-hmm. hey, you you it sets in your mind that I let one get away from me. Yeah. You know, like last year when we let. Um, Phillips come over here and beat us, and we had got right. into the red zone. We did some things we couldn't score, right? And we had in the red zone three times, and and you let one get away. And I know that eats at a coach and that lead on a team for a long time. But the, the, the last Friday night, I just thought the better team won the game from listening to what you guys said. Do you agree? Oh, totally agree. I totally agree that the better team won. Um, and like you said, when you have a score like that, 35-7, to 7, and, and you can look at the stat lines. I mean, again, no turnovers. So you can't go, you know, if it's like if it's a three-point you know, game and you go, wow, man, if we hadn't uh, you know, fumbled the ball there, if we hadn't thrown that interception, that could have changed the game. That could have given us maybe the drive that we needed to get the score. That didn't happen, and you know you look in that second half, and I mean it was it was literally like getting a couple of big heavyweight punches, you know, there late in in the round because what happened was is Vero comes out to start the third quarter with the ball, they go three and out. Deerfield comes right back with a one one pass or two. They had two plays, but one big pass play on a double move, and. You know, that that kid was so wide open. But that's what I'm saying. The play action from the first half, all that running in the first half, set that up. And I think, you know, Deerfield did a good job of setting things up, I think, for the second half because to come out with that play and then later on have another big run from uh, their running back. And I'm going to tell you what. This team has got talent for the future as well. They had a kid that was running the ball late in the in the game at just a – he's a sophomore – at six foot, two hundred and twenty pounds, are you kidding me? He was a bowling ball. Yeah, and that's the uh, thing about uh, high school football now. Kids can come from anywhere and everywhere as long mm-hmm. as they get their their place in there. Yeah, uh, Paul, I want to turn the tide a little bit because you made all the, you did all the games this year as the play by play and the voice of the Fighting Indians. The season overall, though, your thoughts. And again, I ask you because you are the voice. You see it. You talked. 
every game. You broadcast every game. Overall, it was a great year, though. It was an awesome year. I mean, you know, and again, you know, <clears throat> I look at this, you know, and there's there's two sides of this coin I always look at. You know, you go, all right, well, we were 11-1. and one. Yeah, we got to the third round of playoffs. Man, we just can't seem to get past the third round of playoffs. Then I look at the other side of the coin, I go, wow, we were 11-1. and one. We got to the third round of the playoffs. How many programs out there would love to be thinking, wow, we only got to the third round of the playoffs at 11-1? and one? I mean, it's, I think sometimes our success hurts us sometimes because of the fact that we have high expectations. And don't get me wrong, I love the fact that we have high expectations. I love the fact that in some ways we're disappointed that we didn't get further into the playoffs than the third round of the playoffs. But I also look at it and I go, you know what? This team, when we looked at it at the beginning of the season, we looked at that schedule that Coach Jay put together, we did not see an undefeated season coming our way. We certainly did not know if if all the pieces would come together to make a deep playoff run, and we did all of those things. So I tip my hat to Coach Jankowski, that coaching staff, and especially to those players because they got out on the field every Friday night and they put it all on the line. And, I mean, you know, you and I look back at some of those games and we go, I don't know how we won those games, but yeah. we found a way to win. That was the key phrase this year, find a way to win. I thought Lenny Jankowski and his staff probably coached their best football season in, their, in his nine years at Vero Beach High School. I agree. I, I, and and I, I don't mean to take away from any of the other years. Please don't misconstrue that. I just thought that in the beginning when we looked at the schedule and we saw who we were playing, we really thought 7-3 and three would be a good year. Right. And to win our district at 7-3 yeah. and three yeah. would be huge mm-hmm. for our program. Yeah. To go 11-0, and 0, hats off to you, Lenny. Yeah. You did a great job. You got these kids up. I mean, you, 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 you came in – you lost a lot of talent on offense, defense. You had some kids you had to enter on defense. Robert Leslie had to introduce them to his style of coaching because he had transfers in. Mm-hmm. And uh, you had to makeshift a whole new offensive line almost. And you, you, uh, you, you had to get a new quarterback installed into this offense mm-hmm. you had to you had to get your running backs installed i mean you just it was a tremendous job of getting these kids to play every week in and out i i was my hats off to you i think it's your best coaching job as a as a coaching staff and uh that it, nothing ever will never surprise me anymore uh but when uh, the way they won games this year and uh, uh, Ryan Jankowski, I call him Mr. Clutch. He had uh, some great, great games where he won some things on fourth down. The play against Heritage was phenomenal. They opened the season to win that game 7-3, Paul, and then to beat Treasure Coast in, in overtime and, and to to get a big clutch fourth down play. And I mean, I can keep going back and telling there's play after some different plays. <laughs> yeah, right. But this team – Probably played its best. It, this was a great season for me as a fan and as a, a, an analyst to watch because I didn't I didn't see that coming. I didn't see all these things happening, and I think Lenny did a great job. One of his like again, I think it's the best job they've done because uh, I think they've had better some better talent in the past. And have uh, and then they had this year overall. Oh yeah, I agree with you, Gary. I, I you know again, I look at this 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 squad and and you know and you you have to say this kind of carefully because you don't want to send the wrong message here. But I, the word that I use is overachieve because uh, you know you look at how uh, how these guys put these pieces together year in and year out because there's always a group that's going to graduate out and you got to replace those 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 guys that are, have left. They do such a great job of doing that, and I know that's high school football, but believe me when I tell you, when you look at the other programs just around our area here, if you just look at that, and you go, do they have the consistency that you've seen at Vero Beach? And the answer is no. You don't see that. I mean, look, we all thought, and no disrespect to Centennial, but everybody thought Centennial was going to come in this year being a powerhouse team. They didn't put it together the way we thought they were going to put it together. Now, they ended up in the playoffs, 
and kudos to them for doing it. But now they've got big question marks because they're losing a two-year uh, starter at quarterback and some other key components. You know, the thing I want to say this is that Irving Jones from Treasure Coast sees this. Yeah. He sees this. Uh, Cheney, who, who was the head coach down there uh, at Centennial. Well, now Watkins, yeah. Watkins. Yeah. Now they switched coaches, but Watkins was there before as the athletic, athletic, I mean, the offensive coordinator yeah. last year. These programs see what's happening to Vero. Mm-hmm. So they set, we set the bar, and now teams are coming after us. Sure. They know what they've got to do yep. if they want to become the district champ. Mm-hmm. We made a lot of we made two teams a much better team yeah. this past year. Our district was tough. They have three teams in it in the playoffs out of, and from this region, right? And they, from our district, that just shows you how tough the uh, our district is. Think about this, GP. How about on our schedule this year? When it was all said and done at the end of the season, we had seven teams that were on that schedule against Vero Beach that went into the playoffs in round one. Last week, we there were still two teams left, and that was uh, Lake Mineola and Chaminade were still in, in the playoffs along with Vero Beach. You that's, know, that's tough. It is. That's a good schedule. You know, you know, seven out of your ten, ten ball games. That's 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 how many teams made the playoffs, and three, or excuse me, two other ones are in your district in your bracket. <laughs> so a great year, yeah, great year. Well, hats off to these kids, Paul. We know that they're uh, uh, we're, we're the ones that are leaving, and you you just don't replace some of these kids. It's hard to replace, you know. Uh, uh, well, these yeah, you, you think of, you know. I look at this this roster, and I look at that front line, and you know, guys, you know, Nolan and Goodrich, Ray Hall. Phillips, those guys did a, such a great job this year for us, and uh, they're going to be moving on. Of course, Ryan Jankowski, he finishes the season um, with 2,300 yards, a little over 2,300 yards, 22 touchdowns, and only four interceptions on the season. That's fantastic. Isn't it? That is a phenomenal year. Congratulations, Ryan. What a great year. Mm-hmm. You've given us a whole lot. To uh, Your dad and you really were it's like having that coach on the field mm-hmm. when he's out there because his dad will give him the signal. Yep. Then it's up to Ryan to execute it. He did a great job. Jermaine Dawson, 60 catches, 1,085 yards, and 13 touchdowns. And along with Keith Woolard, who actually led the team in receptions this year, was 64, 608 yards, and five touchdowns. What a dynamic duo we had there. And, and, and believe it or not, folks, a lot of their touchdowns were short passes because – our quarterback, Ryan Jankowski, did not have – teams came at him. Mm-hmm. One of our early problems we had was getting too much pressure, mm-hmm. and we weren't able to secure that line as much as you'd like to. You'd like to give your quarterback three to four seconds to throw the ball deep down the field. We were lucky if we had two, two and a half seconds right. to get rid of the ball yeah. and made our whole game different, mm-hmm. installed a whole new game for our quarterback, our receivers and all, mm-hmm. and they did a fantastic job making it happen. How about this young man that came in to play his senior season at Vero Beach and uh, have been going through, as uh, you probably read about it, uh, Jaden Meisinger dealing with all those knee injuries through his uh, freshman to uh, junior year, and now with the senior season, he comes to Vero Beach. Wasn't even sure if he was going to make it into the lineup. Not only did he make it into the lineup, man, he was one of the key components to that Vero Beach offense. He finishes the season 140 carries. And eighteen, or excuse me, eight hundred and nineteen yards and twelve touchdowns on the ground, on the ground. And five foot eight, a hundred and seventy some odd pounds of of toughness, meanness, and just pure football player. Yep. So on that offensive side, if you're wondering who's coming back, well, uh, up front you're going to have uh, uh, names like Bacon, Brown, McCourt, uh, Amarian Davis, who actually was a starter at the beginning of the season, injured his knee. He's been out all season long. He'll be back next year. Uh, Jason Bigums. Uh, those are the guys up front that you're going to have back. Um, receivers, you got Wendell Bethel and Tyler Wren, who who were starters all season long, coming back for you this year. There'll be some guys that were in in the second team and also some guys probably coming up from uh, from GP squad there on the JV side that'll come up to play receivers. And in the backfield, Bobby McMillan comes back for his senior season as well. So there's some good core there, Gary, that's coming back on the offensive 
defensive side. Defensively, um, you know, we're going to lose guys like James Johnson, uh, Markel Bernard, Isaiah Davis, uh, Emmanuel Thorpe, uh, Akeem Mitchell, Cheech Rojas, those guys, Tyree Simmons, Avion Irving, uh, Trey Bardwell. Those guys are all, you know, graduating. But here's good news. You got Kiana Coote coming back. He's already has an offer from Alabama. Okay, he's coming back. You got Brandon Neely, Chandler Taylor, Trevante O'Neal. All of these guys got significant playing time on that defensive line. Uh, Davon Hicks is coming back as a linebacker. Equan Anderson, Jimmy McKinney. Uh, these guys are all coming back as pretty much your veteran staff at linebackers. Uh, Niger Brown's coming back in the secondary. So Coach Ray Hall's got his work cut out for him because he's really just about all replacing his entire secondary there. So he's got some pieces to build uh, around Niger Brown, who had a, a finished very strong with a couple of interceptions to finish out the season. The key question will be who will quarterback us next year. Maybe it's one of the guys that's in the backup position. Yeah. Or it may be a transfer coming in. Who knows? You never know. I mean, you know, obviously – Trey Brady, who who was doing punting, and by the way, had a phenomenal game on Friday night with his punting. Absolutely helped flip the field a couple times for Vero Beach. He's coming back uh, along with uh, Trevor O'Brien. Um, so we'll see. You know, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of time between now and by the time we get to spring practice to find out. You know, who's who could potentially be the uh, projecting starter for Vero Beach or even the backup for that matter. So uh, because Joey Rahal, who was our backup, he was a senior. Uh, he's he's moving on as well. So back he was he did our a great backup, job, backup for a, quarterback, but a great snapper. job for long snap. Yeah, not one bad snap all year. Yeah. Not talk, one bad snap. Talk about a utility player. Oh, Joey Rahal. Yeah, and when he if he were when he gets in the game, he's smart. He knows the offense. Yeah, did a great job. He did a great job. Well, unfortunately, for like most teams, there's only one team that gets to finish the season with a win, and unfortunately, Vero's not that team this year. So we'll have to see. We'll we'll uh, you know get ready for uh, spring practice in a few months and uh, see what see what the optimism is for for the next team that'll be coming out for the year. 2020. Can you imagine that, GP? Right around the corner, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I will start thinking about our, our basketball squad here and yes. see see what kind of team's going to be out on the court here. We'll uh, talk to Coach Whitsett and see uh, see what we're going to have. So uh, we'll we'll continue doing our podcast and we'll keep you updated on what's going on because uh, not only with basketball but uh, we've got uh, you know uh, potential college signings that's going to go on here as recruiting. There's early recruitment and then of course then you've got the the national big signing day in February that'll come up as well. So we'll try to keep you updated on what's going on with that and everything with Vero Beach football. That'd be fun. It sounds like a lot. Uh, We want to wish everybody a great, happy Thanksgiving. And, and Paul, it was a pleasure again working with you and Matt and uh, GT and Ronnie and and Derek uh, West and Don Dexter. It was just a tremendous, a lot of fun, great time. Our, our post game get together after the game, <laughs> yep. we, we have a lot of fun doing that, and we enjoyed that. Yep. And uh, that part will I, I'll always miss after football season's over is the the getting together afterwards and and and, and just enjoying mm-hmm. each other's company. Yeah, it is a lot of fun, and I agree with you. It's, it's that's that's the the stuff that you miss. So maybe we'll just have to keep that going too. Yeah. I don't know if our wives will agree to that. Well, but. we got to thank Lenny Jankowski for being oh. such a a great guy to work with. Yep, a guy you guys he gives you a, all the time. You and Matt need to broadcast that uh, or to do his tape his show. And uh, what 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 a just a a great individual, a fun guy to talk about. Yep. Yeah, Coach Jay, he does a, a lot uh, to help us uh, get ready for Friday nights and, and anything that we want, honestly, uh, whether it comes to basketball, football, or whatever we, we want to cover. Um, he does a tremendous job as the athletic director and, of course, as the football coach. Um, he does such a, a great job of giving us the information to help us sound a whole lot smarter than we are. So we appreciate that. So Well, maybe next week what we'll do is we'll come back, we'll talk about the winner of the uh, games, yeah. who's going to be going into the finals, and we'll talk about rivalry week this week, uh, games like uh, Florida, Florida State. And uh, we won't. I don't know who Miami's playing. Miami's just got to look at itself in the mirror. That's that rivalry this week. That's that's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't bring it up. I wasn't going to bring no, it up. No, I appreciate to you. that. I mean, it's 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 totally. You know, I'll just say it. It's embarrassing. And we got UCF <laughs> playing South Florida. So 
we'll bring you up to date on the uh, yeah. some football, college football next yeah. week. We'll get back and we'll set up the basketball. All right. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And we'll catch up with you next week. And as always, go Indians. Thanks for joining us inside the Press Box. For more, go to ChristianFM.com.